Dr. Feller has a little more of an introduction than I normally like to give. And the reason being is his introduction, his background is so impressive. Let me tell you something. When I pull, pulled up his biography and his, his expertise, I pulled up 33 pages on my computer. And I know that nobody in here is going to listen to 33 pages worth of information, no matter how interesting. So I cut it down as best I could. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a real brief synopsis. Dr. Feller is a board certified diagnostic radiologist with a subspecialty in orthopedic sports medicine, uh, medicine imaging, body and MRI, and a level two cardiac CT certification. More recently, Dr. Fellow has worked to develop an MRI-based prostate cancer detection program, including MR-guided focal laser ablation for prostate cancer. Desert Medical Imaging was the first in the world to perform this outpatient focal therapy procedure for prostate cancer. Let me just elaborate a little bit on that before I go on with the introduction. We've all asked, is it necessary to take out the whole organ? Is it necessary to radiate the whole organ? If we just have a tumor or two tumors or three tumors, can't we just radiate or cut those or ablate or laser? This is what Dr. Feller is pioneering here. And this is some of the things you're gonna hear him say tonight. Dr. Feller received an undergraduate degree in metallurgical engineering and material science at the University of Notre Dame. Now, I almost cut that out because what's that have to do with prostate cancer? But then I read the next sentence. Graduated cum laude. How can I cut that out? Then he received his medical degree at the Ohio State University School of Medicine, graduating summa. Dr. Feller completed his internship, residency, and fellowship training at the Stanford University School of Medicine, culminating in board certification in diagnostic radiology in 1991. Following training, Dr. Feller served as a U.S. Air Force Major and Chief of MRI at David Grant U.S. Air Force Medical Center position he maintained for four years. The reason he maintained it for four years is he had to stay in the military for four years because all the training they gave you beforehand. I'm not actually, and that's not in your bio. I didn't, didn't mean to say that. But I know I was, I was in the military, so thank you very much for your service in the military, Dr. Feller. We appreciate it. Um, then uh, continued his academic affiliation with Stanford University for 15 years as an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Radiology. He was awarded the Volunteer Clinical Faculty Teacher of the Year in 1992-93 in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. Currently as an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Radiology at our own Loma Linda University here. In 1998, Dr. Feller became a founding partner of Desert Medical Imaging and is currently medical director and owner of Desert Medical Imaging. In 2007, Dr. Feller became a partner in Advanced China Healthcare, which is the first American-owned multidisciplinary outpatient health care facility in China and he currently serves as a director of radiology. Very, very impressive. I'd like you all to welcome Dr. John Feller. Thank you very much. Thanks, Russ. I'm gonna start out things here with a slide that I came across. I was a flight surgeon for a little while before I was a radiologist in the Air Force. And I came across this, um, these were medical standards for disqualification for people applying to be a pilot in the U.S. Air Force. This is from 1952. And you can see there are some reasons for medical rejection for, for applying to be a pilot. Some of these make sense. All tumors which are of sufficient size to interfere with wearing military headgear. Probably you can't be a pilot. But I like number eight down here that's just off the field of view here. It says extreme ugliness. <laughs> um, so this is from a real 
U.S. military uh, medical document in the 1950s. So hopefully this isn't why I was invited to speak to you tonight. The reason that I'm here is that we all share a passion for understanding um, the diagnosis, detection, characterization, treatment, follow-up, and humanity, really, of prostate cancer. And uh, um, so one of the first things I'm gonna talk about is you know, that I spent a lot of time just trying to understand what's important to the patient. So you'll see here it says, you know, what uh, prostate cancer patients care about. So finding clinically significant cancer, if they have it, right? Getting an accurate Gleason score. So this is the grade of the prostate cancer. This needs to be accurate because this is the most important determinant for the patient's prognosis and therapy. Very important, not over-treating clinically insignificant prostate cancer. It's important that the patient understand the risks of any treatment that they're undertaking. But how about this? You know, more and more as we're saying that you should be in active surveillance, maybe not have any treatment. Well, what are the risks of no treatment? And then finally, the costs of treatment. Um, you know, uh, this is a very important issue. So every time I interact with a prostate cancer patient, I try to keep in mind this list of things that uh, I know to be important for the patient. Now there's a lot of Chinese proverbs out there, but I like this Eskimo proverb, North American one, unless you're the lead dog, the view never changes. So most of us don't wanna be looking at the backside of the dog our whole career, right? We pride ourselves in trying to understand cutting edge technology, the latest things in our field. And once we become a cancer patient, really um, understanding what the latest and greatest things are in case it's something that may impact our own care. Now, that has to be balanced with this statement. You know, just because something's the latest and greatest and newest doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to bring to bear on our community. This is from an orthopedic surgeon in one of the main journals. It says the public often confuses the latest technique with the best, but that perception, often reinforced by the media, arises from lack of education and the failure to understand the process of medical progress. So just because something's new and the latest and greatest doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Unfortunately, it's the case that research with regard to prostate cancer, we have to be very, very patient. Most of the time, this disease is very indolent, meaning slow growing. So you'll see the studies can sometimes take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to publish results. Meanwhile, patients such as yourself are sitting there or spouses of patients going, why isn't this the standard of care. Why doesn't insurance cover this? It's because prostate cancer is so indolent and we need these outcome studies that many times can take a decade or longer to understand if they're of value or not. So we have to balance the enthusiasm of new things with the discipline to make sure that these new things don't hurt our patients. It's a very careful balance. So prostate cancer, you're all very well aware of most frequently diagnosed form of non-skin cancer in men, 25% of all cancer diagnoses in the United States. That's a staggering number. After lung cancer, this is the second leading cause of cancer death in men. One in six men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Very, very common. And still in 2014, one in 35 will die from their disease. Now something very important that I'm gonna to say to you that you may not have heard before, but I want you to take out of here and make an actionable item. And that is that once you get the diagnosis of prostate cancer, it's a fact that you're far and away more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than you are from your prostate cancer. So if you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and you haven't recently had your cardiovascular risk factors assessed and seen your heart doctor, Get that signed up and do that. Because unfortunately, statistically, that's still far and away more likely to take your life than the prostate cancer is. Let's talk about the current problems with prostate cancer. One is screening, right? It's gotten kind of a bad rap recently. Not because it doesn't reduce mortality from prostate cancer, because it does. The problem is that it's associated, especially in the United States, with overdiagnosis and over treatment of clinically insignificant disease. We've got to fix that. Also, the 
current gold standard, the random transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy, done by most urologists, has a false negative rate of 30 to 35 percent. What does false negative rate mean? That means you miss one third of the cancers. Why is that? Is that because it's a bad doctor? No, not at all. It's because this test is done randomly. The biopsies are just random placements of the needle. Also, the current gold standard, the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, under Gleason scores 30 to 40 percent of the time. The Gleason score, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a couple of minutes, is the most important biomarker, right, for prostate cancer. The higher the Gleason score, generally the worse the prognosis, right? And the most important determinant of how we treat the patients. Also, clinical staging, so meaning trying to figure out where the cancer has spread just based on clinical features like digital rectal exam, it underestimates the actual stage or the actual spread of the disease in 15 to 25 percent of patients. Staging is also very important in prognosis and therapy. Here's another problem. One quarter of patients that are in active surveillance, so these are patients that have low volume, low risk, low Gleason score prostate cancers like Gleason score skin six disease, 25% of them in which we're just following them year over year and doing the random biopsy and following the PSAs, they actually have undetected prostate cancer that's a higher Gleason score that has no business being treated with active surveillance. They need definitive therapy and they don't know it. Why? Because it's been undergraded with that transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Another problem, the morbidity associated with whole gland therapy. So whole gland therapy has up, up to a 50% chance of causing some erectile dysfunction and up to a 25% chance of causing some urinary incontinence. And unfortunately, some patients who have both. So whole gland therapy has some real side effects that we need to continue to work on. The next problem area is biochemical recurrence. That phrase means patients who've had whole gland therapy and their PSA goes to zero or nearly zero, and then a few years later that PSA starts to start crawling back up and creeping back up. We know that those patients generally have recurrent prostate cancer. The question is, is it spread distantly, that's distant metastasis, or has it recurred in the prostate gland or the surgical bed? That's called local recurrence. So that's a list of the problems. The other problem is kind of a funding and public awareness issue. This is data from the NIH, National Institute of Health, and the NCI, National Cancer Institute, 2010, comparing breast cancer and prostate cancer. Breast cancer, while it's a similar clinical problem, about 200,000 new cases, and prostate cancer, 218,000, 40,000 deaths from breast cancer, 32,000 from prostate <coughs> cancer. Notice that funding for federal research is like $900 million for breast cancer, and for prostate cancer, it's more like 400,000. So, less than half the amount of funding. So we need more public awareness, we need to discuss, have more dialogue, we need to vote. You know, the people we vote for, we need to make sure that they're representing us well in terms of getting good funded research done with regard to prostate cancer. Any astronomers in the group? Syzygy, it's a great Scrabble word. Um, S -Y -Z -Y -G -Y. It means when three celestial bodies become collinear or all line up. And when this happens, astronomers get all excited. Um, and astro astrologers, they get even more excited, right? They send all their friends and family to Sedona. The big spaceship's gonna land. It's the end of the world kind of stuff. Um, so I talk about there being kind of a syzygy with regard to prostate cancer. So this is a Chinese star map, an antique map. And here I'm just kind of showing, you know, one of these syzygies of three celestial bodies lining up. Well, with prostate cancer, I talk about the prostate syzygy as being three things that have lined up in the last five years. One is the emergence of a new type of MRI for detecting prostate cancer. That's called multiparametric MRI. The second is that the manufacturers of imaging devices have come up with new hardware and software that allows us to do MR-guided biopsies and MRI-guided procedures to treat prostate cancer. And then the third thing that's lined up 
is our improved understanding of the natural history of prostate cancer, especially called the index lesion. We know in 80% of patients that prostate cancer is in more than one place. That's called multifocal. But in 92% of patients, it's only the largest, highest Gleason score focus of prostate cancer that tends to determine the patient's survival. That's the one that tends to be the bad actor that can metastasize and take the patient's life. So this index lesion concept is important. Let's talk a little bit about screening. Um, physical exam, there's something called the digital rectal exam that we're all aware of as then. The sensitivity being the ability to pick up prostate cancer by inserting the finger in a patient's rectum is, is only 37%, so it's not very sensitive. Then we have this blood test, the serum PSA. This blood test is prostate specific. It's not prostate cancer specific. So inflammation of the prostate gland, prostatitis can make it go up. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, benign enlargement can make it go up. And cancer can make it go up. So it turns out 15% of men with a normal PSA have prostate cancer that's been missed. 70% of men who have a PSA over four considered abnormal, 70% never develop prostate cancer. So it's not a particularly good test in terms of detection of prostate cancer, but it is a reasonable screening test if you can address this problem of overdiagnosis and overtreatment of clinically insignificant disease. There are several studies in the New England Journal of Medicine, this is a European one, that have looked at screening PSA. This study, 182,000 people, Patients were randomized between screening with the PSA and a control group that had no screening. They had almost a 10-year follow-up period. And in this study, the PSA did reduce the death rate, screening did reduce the death rate from prostate cancer by 20%. But it was not felt to be a good screening test because of this overdiagnosis and overtreatment problem. There's a zonal anatomy you may hear about, your doctors talking about with regard to prostate cancer. And this is just the location of the prostate cancer. 70% are in the periphery. So the artist rendition here, this purple part is called the peripheral zone. Five to 10% are in the central zone. That's this green area near the base of the prostate gland. So here's the urinary bladder. Here's the penis down here. So near the base, this green area, that's central zone tumor. And then the fuchsia colored area, this is the transition zone. And about 20% of prostate cancers occur there. So how about Gleason score? This is a, a nice set of slides that Tom Hombra put together that I borrowed. You know, what do dogs and prostate cancer have in common? Well, Gleason grade three disease is very, very benign sort of disease, okay? So here's the pattern we see under the microscope. We can see these ducts here. This is the normal architecture. And it looks like this warm, fuzzy little chihuahua here in the, in the nice little outfit that's never gonna do anything bad to his owner. With intermediate aggressive prostate cancer, Gleason 4 disease, though, we lose that, that normal ductal architecture. And, you know, this dog, when we look at it, we're not quite sure, right? Is that dog going to take a bite out of me or not kind of a thing? With higher Gleason score disease, though, you know, where there's a complete loss of the ductal architecture and the nuclei, which are these little blue staining parts of all these cells, are very irregular. These are the signs of an aggressive prostate cancer. The higher the Gleason grade, the more aggressive the cancer. But remember, Gleason score is the sum of two numbers. The first number is the most common pattern. The second number is the second most common pattern of the cancer. Those two are added together. And generally, it's going to be something between 6 and 10. How about clinically significant prostate cancer? What does that mean when your doctor says that? Well, in its most simple sense, it's a tumor that poses a significant risk to your health. From a practical standpoint, it turns out tumor volume is important. So it's a tumor that's greater than a half of a cc. Any tumor with at least a grade four or five pattern. So three plus four and above, anything with a four in it is considered clinically significant. And then any tumor that extends outside the capsule, so extra capsular extension if it's spread to lymph nodes, into the seminal vesicles, that's considered clinically significant. Talk about that truss biopsy technique. Schematically here, though, many of you have probably had this. The ultrasound transducer is inserted into the rectum. 
and then random biopsies are done of the prostate gland. This is the current gold standard still, and there's between 1 and 1.2 million of these done in the U.S. About, on average, 12 random core biopsies are done. Notice that the sensitivity is only 40%, the specificity 80%. The negative, the false negative rate, so this means how many times when there's cancer there is it missed, happens about one third of the time that the cancer's missed. In many of these patients, they'll have a second biopsy session if the first one's negative, maybe a third, a year or two later, and the detection goes from 40% to 15 to 20% to 8%. It keeps going down. And the reason is that the cancers that tend to get missed are the ones that are far in the front of the gland, uh, pretty far away from um, the urologist's uh, biopsy device. So no matter how many times you, you biopsy it, um, you, you're going to tend to miss it. Now, it's still the case in the United States that if a patient has a negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy session, that they may go on to have something called a transperineal template biopsy or a saturation biopsy. And this is where a grid is put in the patient's perineum. So that's the part that's between the scrotum and the anus or the rectum. Uh, an ultrasound transducer is inserted in the rectum. And then up to 60, 60 core biopsies are done through the skin using general anesthesia. Now, in 2014, now that we have MRI, I kind of like to borrow a line from Samuel Jackson in Pulp Fiction, where he said he's going to go medieval on the guy. To me, this procedure is kind of going medieval on the patient. I mean, this is almost a percutaneous prostatectomy. Why, why in the world would you do 60 cores through the skin with general anesthesia when you could just do an MRI? And if you see something suspicious, go ahead and biopsy it under MR guidance. So, a real common problem or dilemma that the urologist and patients face is a situation where the PSA is elevated and rising and that transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is negative. So what we have then is a patient that can end up with no diagnosis and real concern that the lack of diagnosis is just due to sampling error, okay, due to the fact that the biopsy is done randomly. Now the analogy I like to use here is imagine for our women that there was a test called a BSA, a breast-specific antigen, and if that came back positive, that we told you know our wives, our mothers, our daughters that we're going to randomly biopsy all four quadrants of both breasts, and if that's negative, we're going to have them come back in a year and re-biopsy them, and we're going to tell the woman, oh by the way, there's a one-third chance we've missed your breast cancer, but we're going to let it grow for a year, and when you come back, we're going to randomly biopsy both breasts again. I mean, obviously that sounds crazy. Nobody would, you know, do such a thing. But we've had to do that with prostate cancer for decades because really we didn't have anything better. So, you know, we've had this situation where patients, you know, feel like this little chihuahua here, you know, eyes wide up, ears down, praying that this chair doesn't collapse on the dog. And this is the, the man who literally has had the negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy that's sent home not knowing if he has cancer that's just been missed. So what's new? Well, this new type of MRI is called multiparametric MRI. Um, I don't know if you could, maybe you could slide the table just a little bit forward. You know, clip it off, and I'm going to take my tie off here. Hold on one second. Is that more better? Yes. Much better. <laughs> Thank you. Incidentally, the reason I've been walking around the room is it got a little warm in here, so I turned the air conditioners all down for you. Thank you. So the multiparametric MRI is a relatively new type of MRI. It's been around for five years or so. And the way to think about this is like your first trip to go see the Statue of Liberty, you know, or, or maybe more recent than when you've gone. You're out there in the ferry boat, you're going around the Statue of Liberty, and you can take black and white pictures with your camera. You can take color pictures with your camera, or you can take video, right? So a bunch of different ways to memorialize the Statue of Liberty with one device. But with MRI, we can take pictures of your prostate gland many different ways. And those different ways are called T2-weighted imaging, which shows us anatomy, diffusion-weighted imaging, which helps us to look for areas that could be cancer, and then also dynamic contrast-enhanced imaging, where we start an IV in you, we give some contrast, 
And the rate at which that contrast is taken up in different parts of the prostate gland indicates whether or not there are new blood vessels, neovascularity, due to cancer forming. Because cancers are smart. They build their own infrastructure. They build their own blood vessels to supply them with oxygen and with nutrients. So we use that contrast enhanced imaging to find those. We don't use spectroscopy. Some of you may have come across that. It's mostly done now in the university setting for research purposes, but not so much in day-to-day -day clinical practice at, at this point. We do use computer-aided detection technology. So all the images we get from this new type of MRI, we send to a computer workstation, there's all kinds of color overlay images and fancy segmentation techniques that allow us to analyze your prostate gland in a very, very complex and sophisticated way. Interestingly enough, all this technology was driven by the entertainment industry. This segmentation software for 3D volume measurements is stuff that came to us from video games. So it all started in entertainment and is now making its way into medicine. How about the endorectal coil? Some of you may have experienced studies where you have your MRI done with a coil inserted in your rectum. Turns out that's not necessary for detection and localization of prostate cancer. If you are having spectroscopy, it can be helpful. That's generally a research tool, and it can be helpful for localized staging. But for detecting prostate cancer, it's not necessary. So we don't routinely use an endorectal coil. And my philosophy here is the best test to find prostate cancer is the one patient will undergo. So there are a lot of ethnic groups, religious groups of men who just say, you know what, I'm, I'd rather die of my prostate cancer than have you know, a study done with, with this device inserted into my rectum. So it's actually, it turns out, not necessary for detection and localization. So what do we look for on this new type of MRI? We look for something called T2 shortening, so it's dark. On the T2 images, we look for restricted diffusion, and we look for increased blood vessel supply to the tumors. I'll show you what this looks like. So from across the room, when you look at this prostate gland and the T2 weighted images, most of you can see that this looks different. It's dark compared to the bright signal in most of the rest of the gland. On the diffusion weighted imaging, because of restricted diffusion, cancer cells get very, very compact and they restrict the ability of water molecules to bounce around and diffuse. That's called Brownian motion. And when they do that, they show up very, very dark on this ADC map image. The other part of the diffusion weighted image is called a high D value image, and it shows up bright here. So we kind of call this light bulb medicine. This is like a janitor sequence. I could say, hey, Joe, you know, if the janitor's in cleaning up the offices, where do you think the cancer is? You say, well, I don't know much about what I'm looking, like, looking at, but that looks bad up there, okay? So this makes it easier for us to find these cancers. It also turns out that the more diffusion is restricted, the more aggressive the tumor is. So notice that as you go from this tumor here to this one to this one, see how it gets darker and darker in these three different patients? The Gleason score goes up. Gleason six, Gleason seven, Gleason nine. So the more the diffusion is restricted, the more aggressive the tumor is, and we can tell that just looking at it, even before we stick a needle in it, that it's more likely to be aggressive. The contrast enhanced portion, we get a color overlay image, and the red and yellow areas and green areas are the places of rapid enhancement, with the red area being a rapid washout. What does that mean? It just means that if we put a cursor on it and measure how bright it is from the contrast, the uptake is fast and the washout is fast because these cancers make their own blood vessels. So there's quick inflow, quick outflow. That's called neovascularity. Now, individually, the accuracy of all these different ways of taking pictures of your prostate gland are good, 70 to 86 percent, but not great. When you combine them all together, they're great. Okay, this is a type of a statistical analysis called an ROC curve analysis. And if this number is 1.0, the area under the curve, that's perfect. So 0.91 is a very, very good combination of tests to detect and localize prostate cancer. Well, what are our chances with MRI of missing prostate cancer? If the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy misses one third, how many do we miss with MRI? It turns out for Gleason four plus three and above, so aggressive prostate cancers, we find 97% of them. We only miss 3%. So this isn't you know a few percent better. This is tens of percents better than the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. 
For 3 plus 4 and above, it's 90%. So we only miss about 10% of those. So this type of MRI compares very favorably to the older transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Also, many of you will ask, well, is there a big difference between 1.5 Tesla and 3 Tesla? The emerging data suggests that as a minimum requirement, you need 1.5 Tesla. That's considered adequate. 3T is considered to be a little bit better, but only for certain things. So in 2014, I think for detection and localization, you can have your study done on a 1.5 Tesla system or a 3 Tesla system. The key is that the radiologists that are setting up the protocols and interpreting your studies are experienced at setting up these protocols. I know some doctors that make horrible images on 3 Tesla and don't really know what they're doing, and other ones that make fantastic images at 1.5 Tesla and really know what they're doing. So I find out about your radiologists and what their experience is with detecting prostate cancer and pay more attention to that than the field strength of the MRI system. How about the indications for this new type of MRI? Well, if you have an elevated or rising PSA and your truss biopsy is negative, if the digital rectal exam is positive and your transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is negative, if the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is positive, to stage the disease and also to make sure you're not missing higher Gleason score disease that's been missed. If you're a patient who has biochemical recurrence, the MRI is helpful to see if you have local recurrence in the prostate bed or if it might be distant metastasis. And then if you're in active surveillance, it's helpful just to make sure that you belong in active surveillance. Make sure you're not harboring something that would warrant you having definitive therapy. So here's a study from Journal of Urology within the last two years. The conclusion of the study was absence of a tumor suspicious region on multiparametric MRI has a negative predictive value of 96 to 100% for the presence of higher grade disease. Meaning if your MRI is negative, it's extremely unlikely that you have higher Gleason score disease that's been missed. So it's a big confidence stamp that you can stay in active surveillance with Gleason 6 disease. Here's a study from the NIH just published within the last year that looked at some of the um, uh, active surveillance clinical assessments. Some of you may be aware of D'Amico, Epstein, Capra. These are clinical assessment scores that may have been assigned to you based on different characteristics of your prostate cancer. But notice the accuracy of these clinical assessment scores for determining whether or not you should be in active surveillance is not near as good as it is for MRI. The accuracy is 92%. So more and more you're gonna see MRI added directly to active surveillance. So, the Europeans are a few years, probably two, three years ahead of us here in the U.S. with regard to their urologists and radiation oncologists embracing the value of MRI. This is from one of their main journals, European Urology, and the summary of this article basically said, published data underlined the emerging role for multiparametric MRI as the most sensitive and specific tool available for imaging prostate and this is quickly being embraced now also in the United States. Now, if we do an MRI on you and we see a tumor suspicious region, what next? How do we biopsy? Well, we don't do random biopsies. Instead, we do a targeted biopsy. Well, what does that mean? I'm going to use kind of a military aphorism here. The ultrasound guided biopsy is random. Essentially, all we do is find the prostate gland and then randomly biopsy it. And for me, that's a bit like the old carpet bombing with B-52s, where we wouldn't know where the bad guy was, but we'd fly over such a wide area and drop so many bombs, eventually we'd get the bad guy. Now, that was okay, we'd get the bad guy, but the cost was high. And also, if you were the neighbors of the bad guy, it didn't go so well, right? Collateral damage was high. Well, with an MR-targeted biopsy, we find the tumor suspicious region in the gland, put a little crosshair on it, and we just biopsy that. We don't mess around doing random biopsies. And this is more like the smart bombs you first started to see at Desert Storm, where instead of dropping a whole bunch of bombs all over the place, you just drop one. And with a video camera, you could literally watch it fly in the back door of the bad guy. We're happy because we got the bad guy, and the neighbors are happy because they didn't want the bad guy in their neighborhood anyway, but their house doesn't get blown up, right? So much more strategic and targeted 
And that's what a targeted MRI biopsy means. So to summarize the problems with the ultrasound guided biopsy, first of all, important cancers are missed. Okay, here's the biopsy needle missing a far anterior tumor. This is a tumor way up in the front of the gland near the patient's belly button. Doesn't matter how many times you biopsy back here, you're gonna miss it. Also, clinically insignificant cancers are identified by chance. Because it's a random biopsy, here the urologist needle has found the Gleason 6 disease, but missed the anterior disease that's more aggressive, the 8, 9, or 10. And then finally, the other problem is we can have skimming. So we can have the biopsy catch the Gleason 6 disease, but because of the randomness, miss the higher Gleason score disease that's more important. And as I said, this happens 30 to 40% of the time with transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So targeted biopsy. In every other part of your body, if you see us and we think you might have a cancer, we just put a needle in it with image guidance. We don't randomly biopsy all over your brain or all over your breast or all over your lung. The only place we do that is in the prostate gland still. Every other place, we do a very, very targeted image guided biopsy. So this is what this looks like. Here's a patient, here's their prostate gland on MRI. Here's this little nodule that developed on the surface. Here's a little needle guide in the rectum, and here's the needle going right through that little nodule after we fired the biopsy gun, showing, proving, and confirming that we biopsy this tumor suspicious finding. So the steps are, MR, you know, elevated PSA, then MRI, if there's a tumor suspicious region, do an MR targeted biopsy only biopsy the suspicious areas. Talk a little bit about the procedure itself so you don't feel like these eggs in the carton that are gonna go the way they're buddy here in the frying pan. It turns out the prep, everything about this procedure leading up to it is just the same as having the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So informed consent, off anticoagulation therapy, fleets enemas, you get some antibiotics. You don't have the eating or drinking things for an hour or two before, empty your urinary bladder. We give some conscious sedation to keep you comfortable during the procedure um, and give also some local anesthetic. In terms of your expectations after having an MRI guided biopsy, for us, we're not gonna have you driving because we give you some happy drugs, okay? So you need to bring a driver. You may have a little bit of rectal or anal pain. You may have a day or two of a little bit of blood on the surface of the stool. You may have a little bit of blood in your urine. And you can have some blood in your ejaculate for up to four weeks. Those are all expected, okay? And this is similar to what you see with the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. The risks, though, tend to be lower in our hands with the MR targeted biopsy because we only do three to four core biopsies instead of 12. So excessive rectal bleeding, excessive hematuria, that's blood in the urine, urinary obstruction, so urinary retention, uh, infection. In our hands, after more than 1,000 multi-parametric MRIs and over 400 MR-guided biopsies, the risk is only 0.8%, so less than 1%. And in the literature for the transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy, the complication rate is quoted between 2% and 4%. So it seems like this is also less risky because we're doing fewer cores. Now I mentioned the hardware and software. I'll just kind of show you what this looks like. But there's all kinds of hardware and software to do this biopsy. This is called a trim device. Transrectal Interventional MRI. This is a device made by a company called Invivo. Maybe Bernadette could raise her hand here. Bernadette Greenwood is our Director of Clinical Services, and she actually helped to develop these products with Invivo, but has since left um, the industry to join our practice as a Director of Clinical Services. So this device is very slick. The patient lays flat on her tummy, and this skinny little endorectal needle guide is put in the rectum for the targeted biopsy. This is the endorectal needle guide. This is actually Bernadette's index finger here. And you can see it's smaller than the diameter of your index finger. So it's more comfortable than the transrectal ultrasound probe. We have fancy software for taking pictures and looking at the prostate gland. And then after we localize the cancer inside the gland, the computer shows us the coordinates to turn the knobs on the hardware to to actually do the biopsy. We use an 18 gauge biopsy needle gun, which is the same size that's used for the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, but this device is MRI compatible. 
Remember, a, a 1.5 Tesla MRI system has a magnetic field strength that's 15,000 times the Earth's magnetic field strength. Very, very powerful. So you can't just go in there with any kind of metal device you want. These all have to be MRI compatible. Now, most of you probably know the Blue Man Group, um, but uh, many of you may not know that somehow we got one of them here, the wide-eyed guy to lay flat here for this artist rendition with the endorectal needle guide here is in place. This is the prostate gland, so it's inserted through the rectum, it's attached to the device, and these are those little control knobs that we use just to turn the handles to the proper coordinates to do the targeted biopsy. This is an image looking at the side of a man's pelvis, so here's his urinary bladder, this is the bone in front, the pubic bone, this is that needle guide, so part of the hardware inserted into the rectum, we can see it with MRI, and we can actually calibrate the inside of this device um, using the software, the computer software, so then the computer knows exactly where the needle guide is. And once it knows exactly where it is, then we just go find the cancer with MRI. So here's one of our MRI images. This dark area in the front of the gland is the tumor suspicious region. We put a little crosshair on it, just like playing a video game. And then this needle graphic overlay, which is called an inspector, that shows the programmed course of our biopsy needle. Shows exactly where our, my biopsy needle is going to go. Shows exactly where the biopsy is going to occur. There's a team that's involved with this. So medicine is a team sport. We've involved uh, not only radiologists, but our urologists, our pathologists to get this program together. Support from the companies that make the hardware and software. And then also the person that takes the images with the MRI machine. That's called an MRI technologist. So a pretty busy team to set up one of these MRI-based programs. Here's the whole team with our first few patients, the urologists in here, uh, people from the industry. This was our pathologist showing us how to collect the specimen. The patient's laying flat here inside the MRI scanner, and the, the trim device, the endorectal needle guide, is in place. And this gray thing surrounding it is actually just the coil. Now, a coil is like a car antenna on your car. That's where we pick up the signal coming out of your body with so that we can get the MRI pictures. Here's the urologist holding the biopsy needle in his hand, doing an MR targeted biopsy instead of a random biopsy. So what literature supports this? You know, how do you know I'm not the snake oil man kind of thing, right? Well, there's very, very good literature in the urology literature in particular. So this is journal of urology, right? So if you're going to see, for example, your urologist, they say, well, I don't believe in MRI. These are the kind of articles, you know, that you can empower them yourself with. Just print this up, take it in there, say, hey, you know, what do you have to say about this? You know, here's a series of 70 patients with a high PSA. They had more than two or more transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy sessions that were negative. And if they had an MRI and an MR guided biopsy, 60% of them had cancers that were picked up as a result of the MRI. Not six, 60%. I mean, that's a big, big number, right? So um, the tumor detection rate is significantly higher than with the trust biopsy. And notice in this study that over 90% of these cancers were considered to be clinically significant. Where were they? Well, not surprisingly, they were in places that were difficult to reach with the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So anterior ones are ones that are far in the front of the gland near your belly button. Ones in the apex are ones real, real low down near the level of the penis. Those are places where cancers tend to get missed. Also notice that instead of doing 12 to 18 random cores in this study, on average only four cores. So think of how many pinches you had for biopsies. Instead of having 12 random every time you go in, with this you only get three or four. So one fourth to one third the number of biopsies are done. The green bars are the tumor detection rate for MRI guided biopsy. So Bigger is better here, 60%, 70%, you see how big these numbers are, compared to third transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy session and second, the blue bars. So the MR guided biopsy has a much higher detection rate than ultrasound guided biopsy. How about this issue of Gleason score? 46% of the time in this study, for Gleason seven and above tumors, Gleason score was undergraded with ultrasound-guided biopsy. Well, how often does that happen with MRI-guided biopsy? 
only 5% of the time. So 95% of the time, you're gonna get a reasonably accurate Gleason score if you add MRI to what's being done compared to just doing the transrectal ultrasound kind of biopsy. How about these different ways of biopsy? It turns out in addition to doing an MR-targeted biopsy, which is probably gonna turn out being the best, we now have this MRI ultrasound fusion biopsy, which is very, very good and emergent. Okay? This is where you take and you do an MRI and you take that data set and you import it into the ultrasound machine. You fuse the two data sets together and you do a fused biopsy. This is emerging technology, mostly in university-based settings. And this is definitely better than just having an old ultrasound guided biopsy. Probably in rank order, in my opinion at this point would be that the most accurate is a direct MR guided biopsy. Second best will be the MR ultrasound fusion. And there's something we call cognitive fusion where the patient has an MRI and then the urologist based on the report says, oh, they're describing a tumor in this location. And then when they do the ultrasound guided biopsy, not only do they do the random biopsies, they do additional biopsies at the site of the MRI abnormality. We call that cognitive fusion. But the least accurate clinically is the old, just random transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here to kind of show you what this technology looks like. This is a 76-year-old male. His PSA, look at this, it's gotten up to 72. That's pretty scary had had four negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy sessions, a total of 48 core biopsies over a six year period. Now this was the last urologist in our community, I'm in the Palm Springs area here in Southern California, kind of a retirement community. The last urologist to refer us a patient for an MRI was this guy. He called me up and he said, all right. He says, I'm, you know, I'm a very conservative guy, but I'm gonna throw you a bone. I want you to work on this patient for me. Um, I'm a bit concerned I'm missing something. So here's his MRI. Um, normally on the T2-weighted images, which is what I'm showing you here, here's the rectum, here's the prostate gland. Normally the periphery, remember I talked about that peripheral zone, should be bright. The transition zone is normally dark. But here the whole peripheral zone is dark in the front of the gland. And that's about five centimeters in size. This isn't a small finding. Here's the ADC map, so dark is bad on this diffusion-weighted sequence. Notice all of that is very dark in the front of the gland. Here's that high B value image. This is that you know, janitor sequence, right, where I asked Joe where the cancer is. Look at how bright this is, completely replacing the whole front of the gland. And this went all the way from the urinary bladder at the base to the mid-gland to the apex level, over five centimeters all the way around. And just looking at this, I knew this was going to be a relatively aggressive prostate cancer. Here's the, the contrast enhanced imaging, all these red, yellow, and green areas are areas of rapid enhancement due to that neovascularity. Here's the kinetic curve, so rapid uptake of contrast, rapid washout, the cardinal features that we look for for prostate cancer. Here's our biopsy needle, a picture after we fired the gun showing the needle through the front of the gland where that tumor suspicious region was located. And here's the biopsy result. Notice here's a few normal ductal elements over here, but most of that is replaced here. And on the high power view, you can see all the nuclei, which are these little purple areas, are all variable size and shape. They should be very, very uniform. And these are all the features of prostate cancer. So this patient had Gleason 4 plus 3 and had some tertiary areas. So the third most common pattern was Gleason grade 5 throughout a very large tumor that went, again, throughout the whole peripheral zone in the front of the gland. So here's a cancer that the urologist basically had missed for six years, where the PSA just kept going up, 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 up. And the reason it was missed was the location of the tumor. So this patient immediately went to a form of radiation therapy that we all know as IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy, but also because of the volume of the tumor and the Gleason score, he had hormone therapy as well. So what happened here? Why did a very, very good urologist practicing the standard of care miss this tumor in this patient for so long? And it's because of this little red line. This little red line is how far the urologist's needle reaches when they're doing the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So you can biopsy again and again and again, but these tumors that are very far in the front of the gland will get missed. 
So it's a bit like this photo of Kobe Bryant and Yao Ming here, right? If Yao Ming holds a basketball over his head at seven foot six or whatever the heck his height is, Kobe can jump up and down all he wants, but he's not gonna get the ball out of Yao Ming's hands. It's too far away. It's the same way with trust biopsy. There are certain parts of the gland, especially when the gland is really enlarged, that are difficult to reach with standard transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy techniques. Here's another patient to stress what we can do with small lesions. Much younger guy, 60 years old, was seen at City of Hope, um, PSA 5.8, had had two negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy sessions, and then went on to have a saturation biopsy. So that's that thing I talked about that was a bit like going medieval on the patient, where a total of 52 cores were done um, transperineally, so right behind the scrotum. Um, so a total of 76 cores that were all negative for prostate cancer. So this uh, guy was referred to us by one of the urologists at City of Hope that had been sending some patients to us. We did an MRI, and this dark thing does not belong in the peripheral zone here on the left. This is the T2 wave image. It only measures about six by seven millimeters, okay, so smaller than your pinky fingernail. Here's the ADC map image. It's very dark because it restricts diffusion. It shows that bright on the janitor sequence, that light bulb medicine sequence, and it enhances a lot. So here's that curve. Remember, this is the cancer curve. Rapid uptake, rapid washout due to these new blood vessels associated with the cancer. So we just did two core biopsies or three core biopsies on this and got a definitive diagnosis of prostate cancer doing an MR-targeted biopsy. Why was it missed? Well, in this case, it was because it was small and because of the random nature. But notice also, even that template biopsy missed this Gleason uh, 3 plus 3 disease. Now, an argument could be made that this is a small volume. It's only Gleason 3 plus 3. You don't want to over-treat this, that's for sure. This is probably an active surveillance patient, but this guy has a real V in his bonnet to treat any cancer that he has, and so he's interested in our focal therapy protocol, but actually at this size, we're just following this with yearly MRIs. So he's elected focal ablation, but has not really pulled the trigger on that yet. He's more really an active surveillance, which we've encouraged him to stay in at this point. So what's our experience in the desert? with this technology, with the MRI and the MR-targeted biopsy. We use a 1.5 Tesla system. We don't use that endorectal coil. We use some special flexible coils that wrap around your pelvis to get good pictures. We don't do that spectroscopy. I've already talked about what our multiparametric MRI is, the T2-weighted, the diffusion-weighted, the contrast enhanced. We use computer-aided detection on all of our patients to help find the cancer. And we do MR-guided, targeted biopsies only. We don't do that random 12-core part of things. We've done well over, we're pushing probably 1,000 of the multiparametric MRIs at this point. Two-thirds of the time, we'll recommend a biopsy. The other third, we tell the patient, hey, you don't need a biopsy. Let's just get a follow-up MRI in here. So right away, that 1 million to 1.2 million biopsies done in the US, we can reduce those by a third just by adding MRI. We pushed over about 400 MR-guided biopsies that we've done, which is about 42% of the patients we've seen. On average, we do three and a half cores, much less than 12. Our complication rate is 0.8%, and the total procedure time is about 30 minutes on and off the table. So it's not as long and complicated as people might think. If you come to see us for this program, about 50% of the time, we find a prostate cancer overall. We found you know, about 200 cancers in 180 patients. On average, we'll find about two tumor suspicious regions on the MRI that will say you need to get a targeted biopsy. In patients who had a negative transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, which are about 20% of the patients we biopsy, our tumor detection rate is 30%. But look at this number. If the patients had no transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy at all, just as an elevated PSA comes to get an MRI and we do an MR-guided biopsy, our tumor detection rate is 61%. It's more than double what it is for transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy. So if these are patients who've had no transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy at all. And more and more, that's what we're seeing. Patients are saying, well, why should I have the transrectal ultrasound-guided biopsy at all? So 25% of all the patients we see now have never had 
the uh, ultrasound guided biopsy. How about the grading? If a patient has a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy proven prostate cancer, we do an MRI and an MR guided biopsy, one third of the time we find higher Gleason score disease that's been missed. So even if you do have a positive transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, you probably should have an MRI. Importantly, you know, we talked about the cost of all this stuff, right? Importantly, all of the multiparametric MRIs we've done and all of the MR guided biopsies have been reimbursed by all payers in the US. I've not so much as had to do a single peer-to-peer -peer review with the payer. So Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medicare, commercial insurance, most of the managed care entities have a set up um, uh, fee schedule for this so that the patient isn't stuck paying for this. The only exception is those disposables. Remember those biopsy needles and that needle guide that I said is special if it's MRI compatible? Those things add up to about $400 and the insurers will not cover that. So that ends up being an out-of-pocket expense for patients that is an additional cost to them. So we have them sign something, you may have signed an ABN before, an Advanced Beneficiary Notice of Non-Coverage that Medicare asks people to sign if it's a service that may not be covered. So the MRI itself is covered, the MR guided biopsy is covered, except for the disposables. The payers don't like the higher cost of those yet. How about whether this is cost effective or not? It turns out that if you compare the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy pathway with the MRI pathway, the costs are pretty similar overall. This is a study published in European Urology, a multi-institutional study in Europe. However, the key part in, in reducing cost is the reduction of overdiagnosis and overtreatment that you get by adding MRI to the equation. And in that sense, quality of life is improved for patients and the cost is less by adding MRI because you don't overdiagnose and overtreat these clinically insignificant cancers. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about the last component of our program. So first component, using the MRI to detect the tumor suspicious region. Second component, using MRI to target the biopsy. Those are emerging as standard of care. This third component is considered investigational. Anybody who's doing focal therapy for prostate cancer this should be done as part of an IRB approved, investigational review board approved trial that is actually regulated by entities that oversee human research. And because it's investigational, no insurance company, Medicare, nobody pays for this. It's gotta be funded through research grants or funded by the patients themselves. So patients can enter some of these trials doing patient funded research where they actually pay to enter the clinical trial. So let's talk about what this is all about. The interest in focal therapy for prostate cancer is completely driven by the morbidity of whole gland therapy, okay? So similar to the paradigm shift that we had with breast cancer 30 years ago, where we went from just doing a, a mastectomy on women for breast cancer, they developed lumpectomy and radiation therapy, right? A kind of focal organ sparing surgery. Well, a similar shift is occurring with with some forms of prostate cancer. The problem is we don't know what energy source is gonna reach the finish line yet. Is it gonna be cold, that's cryoablation? Is it gonna be ultrasound, that's HIFU? Is it gonna be radio, you know, radio frequency, photodynamic? Or in our own case, we have a large experience now with doing laser ablation. But what's driving all of this is to reduce the morbidity associated with whole gland therapy. Remember, up to 50% can get erectile dysfunction up to 25% urinary incontinence. Um, and with hormone therapy, it's even worse. And Bernadette always says that, you know, the men she talked to that are on hormone therapy, sometimes they look at her and say they want to go shopping for shoes, right? There's, there's kind of the male menopause, all the symptoms associated with hormone therapy, right, that can occur. It's a very real side effect. That's also a whole gland therapy. In fact, it, it's a whole body sort of so the question is, can we help to reduce that morbidity of whole gland therapies with this focal therapy? Well, one of the reasons that this has not caught on more quickly was that issue I mentioned before that 80% of the time cancer is in more than one location. But now we know that 90% of the time it's the index lesion that's most important. Well, how do we know that? You 
you know, how, how did they figure that out? Well, um, in, in nature medicine, a study was done, some guys were kind enough to do donate their bodies to science that had died of metastatic prostate cancer. And they went in and studied the DNA. This is a bone scan. All these dark areas are bone metastasis from prostate cancer. They went in and studied the DNA of all these lethal metastases, and they found that 92% of the time, all of the lethal metastases came from one place in the prostate gland, and that's called the index lead. And that one place ended up being the largest volume, highest Gleason score tumor. So how does this work? Well, prostate cancer is multifocal 80% of the time, but the largest, highest Gleason score focus is the one that tends to get into the bloodstream, spread, give metastatic disease, and with time can become castration resistant, and can you know then go on to cost the patient their life. But most of these lethal metastases come from one place. So, you know, even though prostate cancer is multifocal 80% of the time, because of this index lesion, now that we've got MRI and we can find that index lesion pretty reliably, maybe focal therapy is appropriate. We can use the MRI to find the largest, most aggressive focus, go in and just treat that, leave the rest of the gland intact, and that patient hopefully can live and die from something else many years later. But when they die, they're continent, they have good erectile function. So in an outpatient setting, so patients walk in and walk out from their cancer therapy at our clinic under MRI guidance, using just coils wrapped around the surface of the patient's pelvis, and using that same endorectal needle guide device, we introduce an interstitial laser that has FDA approval. Okay, so this energy source actually has approval from the Food and Drug Administration. We have no general anesthesia. The patient walks in, walks out, and most of the time, the last 25 treatments we've done, we don't even need to put a urinary catheter in there. The first 10 treatments or so, we put them in routinely, but patients kept saying, you know what, I could go play golf after this thing if it just weren't for this catheter. Can you get rid of this bloody thing? So we stopped putting in the catheter routinely, and we haven't had to put one in in the last 25 treatments. So here's that hardware you've seen before, but the interstitial laser applicator goes through that same endorectal needle guide. Here's the needle guide. Here's the laser applicator. It's disposable, but it's expensive little thing. That, that one-time use device is about six to $7,000. Use once, throw away. So it's, it's kind of expensive technology. It has a heat diffusing tip and it's water cooled, so we can control the temperature of that thing while we're treating. Also, we use something called MR thermometry with this device. This plugs into our MRI machine, and we can monitor the temperature inside your prostate gland and in the tissues around your prostate gland while we're treating it. We can literally watch as things heat up. So one of the things we'll do is we'll get MRI pictures. We'll draw a little green line around the cancer. This dark thing is the cancer. And our goal is going to be to treat the area inside this green line, which is called contouring. And those of you that have had radiation therapy would know what contouring is. It's basically your treatment area. These little blue cursors are safety cursors. We put those on the rectal wall. We can put them on the neurovascular bundles. We can put them on your external urethral sphincter. And the laser will shut off itself if those start to heat up to a point where they would damage those tissues. So the thing is almost you know, idiot proof in terms of us being able to protect things that we don't want to harm with the laser. This is the thermometry. So here's the laser applicator inside a patient's prostate. There's that endorectal needle guide. The red, yellow, and green areas are a temperature map that we got real time. So what we do is we heat up the tip of the catheter to a febrile illness. We basically heat it up to like 104 degrees Fahrenheit, like the prostate gland had a little fever, and we can see the color, and that proves to us that the laser is right where we want it. Once we have it where we want it, then we can do a treatment. And this yellow area, not these little dots out there, those are just artifact, but this yellow area there, that's called the kill zone, or the irreversible damage estimate. That's where the temperature exceeds 60 degrees Celsius. That causes irreversible cell death immediately. So we literally watch while we're treating real time. So here's the first patient we did. Um, this was, as was mentioned earlier, this was the first patient that was done transrectally anywhere in the world. There had been some other patients done through the skin, 
at University of Colorado and also at University of Toronto. That's called a transperineal technique. But in terms of an outpatient transrectal, um, our clinic was the first to kind of set this up this way. So in 2010, we saw this 72-year-old male, the founder of a pretty recognizable winery up in Napa Valley. His PSA had made it up to 13. He had a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy that showed three plus three equal to six disease. And he was electing to have focal therapy rather than whole gland therapy. We did an MRI on him, but the problem was we saw this dark area and bright area on his diffusion weighted imaging that didn't look at all like Gleason 6 disease. The Gleason 6 disease was back here, and we didn't see it. In fact, MRI is not so good for finding Gleason 6 disease. It only finds about 40% of it, but I don't want to find it. That's the stuff that's getting over-treated, right? So I don't want to see that. This is what I want to see. This looked more aggressive. We biopsied this under MRI guidance. Here's our biopsy needle right through that tumor suspicious region. And this ends up being higher Gleason score disease. Um, this ended up being um, three plus four equal to seven prostate cancer. So this is the guy's index lead. So this is the one that we went in to treat with focal therapy. Here's placing the uh, interstitial laser. This is the prostate gland. Here's the endorectal needle guide. Here's the MRI image. And then here is the real-time thermography. So this image on the left here, the color map shows the temperature inside the gland while we're treating them. And then this yellow area that you see growing, that's the kill zone. That's where the, actually the tissue has been destroyed. You can see that this enlarges with time while we're treating. And each one of these treatments is only about a minute and a half. So to treat a patient's prostate cancer may be a total of only about four to five minutes of treatment. Having said that, the setup is complicated. The whole procedure takes between two and a half and four hours. But this guy, basically, we just went in there and treated that cancer. This is a contrast enhanced image. So we gave some intravenous contrast. The dark area is the area where we killed the cancer. That's called necrosis, coagulation necrosis. The bright area is the normal surrounding prostate gland. So we put a hole right where the cancer is. You might say, well, how do you know that's where it was? Well, the dark area here on the pre-laser MRI is the cancer. Here's the irreversible damage estimate, and there's the hole that we put that almost matches its size and location with the patient's cancer. So at this point, we've done 40 treatments in 31 patients, age range of 56 to 80, PSA values between uh, 1.5 and 14, various Gleason scores. The inclusion criteria for us are only Gleason 6 or 7. If it's Gleason 8 or above, those patients need to go on to whole gland therapy. Um, we've had tumors up to 4 cc's in size that we treated, but we're also treating salvage therapy. You know, there are many patients out there who've had their prostate cancer treated and then they get biochemical recurrence and they have a local recurrence of their cancer and maybe the surgery and radiation's been maxed out and they don't have any other options. Well, our protocol allows for salvage therapy in these patients. We can go in under MR guidance and laser the recurrent cancer, even if you've been radiated before or even if you've had surgery. So what are our results? The procedure takes about an hour and a half to four hours. In the initial patients, we eliminated the MRI abnormality straight away at 80% of the patients. We had no complications, no morbidity, no erectile dysfunction, no urinary incontinence, no infection, no clinically significant bleeding. So we essentially eliminated the morbidity. We had one case where there was some necrosis outside the gland that resolved without symptoms. We have five patients who require retreatment. So we tell patients when they enter this protocol, this is like getting a haircut. We're trying to convert your low risk or intermediate risk prostate cancer into a chronic illness. Okay, cancer is actually the most curable chronic illness. We can't cure diabetes. We can't cure emphysema. But 40% of all cancers are flat out curable. And these Gleason 6s and 7s are clearly in that category. So you come in and see us, you have your MRI, if we laser a lesion, we'll see if for follow-up MRIs, if something else comes in a year, two years later, we can always go in and re-laser it. Okay, it's like getting a haircut. So again, hopefully you have no morbidity, and years later die from something else, but die continent with erectile function. 
our marginal recurrence rate is about 20 to 25 percent. So about one quarter to one fifth of the patients we're having to retreat at this point. So to kind of summarize this research part of things, at this point in time in 2014, this outpatient focal laser ablation procedure we've shown is safe and it's possible. Patients are still retreatment viable, meaning if something gets worse later, you can always go on to have whole gland therapy still. This does not take away the opportunity for other forms of whole gland therapy. I like this continuity of imaging story. People talk about continuity of care, but using the MRI to find the cancer, to biopsy it, to treat it with laser, that same modality and the same team, I think provides for a, a very high quality uh, solution for focal therapy. So, got some take home messages for you. I think there's about eight or nine of them here, but they're fast. Take home message number one, having an MRI based cancer program is a team sport. Notice I talked about urologists working with us, radiation oncologists, pathologists, you know, if you're seeing a doctor that says, oh, this is, we don't work with these doctors, or this is not, you know, the way to go, you might want to shop around for other doctors because clearly prostate cancer is a team sport and the patient's part of that team, right, and their family in terms of how we address these things. And multiple doctors involved with coming up with solutions, sometimes that change with time. Take home message number two, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy misses one third of prostate cancers and leads to overdiagnosis and overtreatment of least in six clinically insignificant cancers. Take home message number three, this multi-parametric MRI misses only 3% of the four plus threes and above and only 10% of the three plus fours. So when you combine that with an MR guided biopsy, the negative predictive value is much better. We just don't tend to miss these aggressive cancers. Next message, MR guided prostate biopsy exceeds the cancer detection rate of second or third transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So if you had a trust biopsy and it's negative, raise your hand and say, hey, how about an MRI? How about a targeted biopsy? Next take home message, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy undergrades the Gleason score 30 to 40% of the time. With MRI, it's only 5% that it undergrades. Next take home message, MR guided or targeted and you can add to this MR ultrasound fusion biopsy. It's fast, can be done in less than 30 minutes, complication rate less than 1%, and our own hands uh, is appropriately done in an outpatient facility. Next take home message, that multi-parametric MRI combined with MR guided biopsy is cost effective. It improves the patient's quality of life in the larger population compared to the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy strategy mostly because it reduces overdiagnosis and overtreatment of clinically insignificant disease. Also, this new type of MRI has an emerging role for active surveillance. If you're in active surveillance, you know, really kind of lean on your doc to see if MRI can be added to that. And then 1.5 Tesla without endorectal coil combined with MR guided biopsy or MR ultrasound fusion biopsy is adequate for detection and localization of prostate now the last message is the most important one. I'm telling you not a day goes by that I don't get calls or handshakes from patients or from their family that really were in harm's way. They get the MRI, we find the cancer, we get a more accurate Gleason score or detect cancer that previously hasn't been found. And these patients are just elated to have more accurate information to drive their, 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 their therapy. Um, so I get calls, thank you cards. I even had a guy send me a German chocolate cake. Okay, the guy wasn't gay either. He, mailed me. he called up the office, said, what's Dr. Feller like? They said, oh, he's got a big sweet tooth. Well, what does he like? Do you like German chocolate cake? Guy mailed me a German chocolate cake with a thank you card. You know, that's, that doesn't happen to radiologists, okay? I can tell you in general. Most of the time when I get a call, it's some doctor that's in the operating room saying, hey, I'm in here, you know, you said this thing was on a scan. I can't find it. What's going on, you know? And, and they're not too happy about it. They don't kind of call up and say, yeah, that was right where you said it was. But with this program, it's amazing the amount of positive feedback that this generates and how much it helps patients um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So here's the three prongs of the program, the multi-parametric MR, MR-guided biopsy. Those two things are ready for prime time. The last component, focal therapy, is still investigational. 
So kind of think of MRI as being your GPS system for helping to find your prostate cancer. So if you were discombobulated at all about MRI and prostate cancer, hopefully we've taken you to the recombobulation area. And there's a phone number and a website and an email address here for anybody that has questions or comments that we don't get a chance to address. Thank you very much for your attention. Normally we have a question, little question and answer session after. Are you up for that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Anybody has a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone around. So it's a great question. What do you do with a 3 plus 4 that was picked up with a random biopsy that's not shown on the fusion biopsy? So the answer to your question is I think it's very reasonable what you've done being an active surveillance. Remember the numbers that I quoted to you. For 3 plus 4 and above, the negative predictive value is 90%. So that means 10%, 1 out of 10 of 3 plus 4 cancers won't be seen with MR initially. So you're the 1 in 10, right? So, but if you're in that category, the upside is it probably means that your 3 plus 4 is low volume disease. If it was large volume disease, it would have been pretty, pretty easy to see. And 10% of a core may be a millimeter, you know, or a couple of millimeters. What if that's the only focus of cancer that, you know, was in your prostate gland and it's that small? In addition to the active surveillance, though, I would do the MRI. If something pops up on your MRI here over here, then that would be an indication to go in and biopsy, you know, using the fusion technology or just under MR guidance. But I think you can be confident continuing with the active surveillance as long as you're also getting a yearly MRI as part of that. Yeah, and Dr. Leonard Marks has a, you know, a very quality team there, great equipment. Um, we're a principal investigator with one of the studies that are ongoing there at UCLA. Last Wednesday, I was there to help do their first laser patient. They're using um, fusion technology to attempt to do a laser. So it's a very progressive group, and you're in good hands there. And clearly, they will include MRI as part of your follow-up. Yeah, my question has to do with focal laser ablation. Uh, you said it's not quite mainstream yet, but I know a lot of people are doing it. Seems to have a lot lower complications, probably lower cost than radical prostatectomy and radiation treatment. And the results I've seen, at least in the short term, seem to be better than radiation or even radical prostatectomy. How long do you think it will be before it becomes mainstream? And why do you think it's not mainstream now? So it's a great question. Um, you know, this process of medical research that we talked about, you'll hear about phase one, phase two, phase three trials, right? So phase one is what most of the facilities are in right now with regard to laser ablation. That's safety and feasibility. Is it possible? Is it safe? And those studies are either wrapping up or close to wrapping up, and all of them show that it is safe and it's feasible, which reflects what you're talking about. With phase two studies, which is what most of us are going to start to be entering into soon, if they haven't already, then you get more into efficacy. And phase three, then, with outcome. The problem is that it takes, as I mentioned, up to 10 years before
before you can establish whether there's a difference in outcome or a difference in survival related to a treatment like this. So anyone who tells you that they can, you know, imply that there's some improvement in survival with focal therapy, you can't. We haven't been doing it long enough. We've been doing it four or five years, and we're one of the longest players. It's still going to take another five to ten years for us to know. And that's a very, very important part of this. Remember, we're treating cancer. So reducing morbidity, we know that that occurs right out of the gate. We know it's safe, we know it's possible. But we can't look at a patient at all and answer the question, well, how, what's my survival? Am, am I gonna do better? Is my survival better because you're doing this focal therapy? Absolutely no one knows that. That's why it's investigational. That's why none of the payers are gonna embrace it yet. So in terms of time frame of what you're asking, it's gonna be in the five year to 10 year time earliest probably five years. At that point, we'll be 10 years out and others as well. Uh, and there'll be enough long-term follow-up. We have a saying in medicine with regard to new technology and medical progress that nothing ruins good results like follow-up. Nothing ruins good results like follow-up. And prostate cancer needs long follow-up. Most of you probably know that the only studies out there that show a difference between doing radical prostatectomy and doing nothing for prostate cancer almost across the board, there's no difference until 10 years out. 10 years, no difference with doing nothing versus whole gland therapy. So we have to do, you know, have these studies go that long before we'll know. And survival is clearly an important issue. Other questions? <clears throat> Two questions. The first one is regarding the focal about the progression where we are in US about the stage. Is there any experience from Europe or Asians in that respect that they have done it for some time as it is in Haifu, for example? And the second question is personal question. I was diagnosed a year ago through trust biopsy, uh, three plus three, two out of 12 uh, were cancerous and 10% only. So I'm on active surveillance right now. But the PSA is right. So it's at 9.7 right now. When I was biopsy, it was around uh, 7.8 or something. And that was a year ago. So again, I think I'm a good candidate for multi-parametric. Yeah, so the personal question first. Straight away, you need a multi-parametric there's a 25% to a 30% chance that you have a higher Gleason score prostate cancer than the Gleason 6. And that would alter how you manage. So I would push very hard to have an MRI. And then if they see something that looks more aggressive than the Gleason 6 disease that you have, then they have either an MR-targeted biopsy or a fusion biopsy. So that's the personal part. Um, the other part is um, uh, in Europe, um, focal therapy in general is kind of lagging what's going on in the U.S. in general. There is a laser site at uh, Radboud University so Ny in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. There's a group there that actually came and trained with us that has a very healthy program that's initiated there. Um, but in general, not much other laser therapy going on. In the U.K., there's a fair bit of HIFU therapy that's going on, so a lot of HIFU work has been done in the U.K. In Asia, not much at all. In fact, you know, if you look at just China as a, a patient population, um, we've looked at this not too long ago, I gave some lectures at the University of Ningbao in China, and there's a complete absence of any screening. Um, the diagnosis of prostate cancer is usually always end stage. Um, you know, if you look at the cancers that we detect with our program, almost all of them are released in sixes or sevens. Only a handful of them are released in eight, nine, eight, nine or 10. So we're picking up smaller cancers earlier with screening and with MRI. In China and in Asia, there's just prostate cancer is not really even on the on the um, on the you know on the radar map at this point. Um, but um, there's a lot of dialogue there, you know, with this huge patient population with the government's interest in uh, privatizing healthcare to a certain extent. That this is going to change pretty rapidly in China. Obviously, in Japan. And
in some of the more developed healthcare countries, Singapore, those places uh, are much further along, and, and you'll find multi-parametric MR-based programs that exist in those countries currently, but not, not so much in China. Anybody else? All right, Dr. Feller, looks like that's it for tonight. Uh, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, you know, because of the prostate cancer budget, we can't afford to pay you any money here, but we're going to give you something equivalent. And a doctor's time is money. So if I can save you some time, I'm going to earn you some money. So here's a coffee cup that fits in your car so that you don't have to stay at home to drink your coffee in the morning. You can drink it in your car. Dr. Miller, thank you very much. Give it up for an excellent presentation. Thank you very much.